What's up, my podcast listeners and all my YouTube subscribers? I am pumped today to bring to you another compilation episode. And today we are going to focus on core training. And it's a very interesting topic because everyone has a huge opinion. And funny enough, a lot of it is wrong. Um, only because um, there's still a lot of people who think for some odd reason that um, doing crunches is worthwhile. Um, and in these episodes, I go over that whole weird idea. And th this is this is the thing. I'm gonna I think I'm gonna go on a rant here for a little bit is a lot of people that make the argument that doing crunches is like one of the best core exercises is equivalent to someone who's playing basketball on a, you know, playground level once a week, going to a NBA coach, telling them that he should run a certain defense in his next game. That's what we're dealing with here. But that person who plays weekend basketball firmly believes that that is the best way. Whereas the coach has a lot of experience and has won championships and has followed his or her mentors um, for years without end doing things that are tried and true when it comes to success. So when people try to argue with me on this thing, it's like, have you read any piece of research on low back health and biomechanics of the spine and just things that are literally proven and they still, they still don't get it. So there's a couple ways to look at it. One is true core training, like what exercise to do specifically, and also what you put in your mouth to have like visibly noticeable abs, right? And a lot of times those are two different goals, which people need to understand. If you just want a core that is visible, then really it does not matter what you do for exercise. Go ahead, do fucking crunches. I don't, I don't care. I don't care because if the goal is just to have them visible, just follow a really restrictive diet to get you to a certain body fat percentage so you can see them. If we're talking about let's create a more functional and strong core that's going to prevent low back pain and I can generate um, great amounts of force to help me in athletic settings, then that's a whole different conversation. But a lot of times people blend those together and they don't really know what they want. Because if you are an athlete, say a rotational athlete, like a golfer, baseball, hockey, whatever it is, you probably don't care about having visible abs because you want to be able to perform well. But the thing is, is if you are performing well at a high level and you're doing all the right training and you're probably eating somewhat fairly good, visible abs are gonna come anyway. The amount of people that I know since my career started 11 or 12 years ago, um, who were in that kind of bodybuilding or figure competing, competing, competitor um, realm where they did endless amounts of crunches and now, you know, 10, 11 years down the road and I still know who they are, they all have some messed up low backs and hips and stuff that could have been prevented, you know? And I think a lot of times when people want a strong core or a visible core, they tend to forget what the most important thing is, is longevity. Because sure, right now you might want to have abs, but how are you going to feel in 20 years from now with your low back? Me working in a clinic setting, I see this shit all the time. People used to be studs in university or high school, whatever it was, and now they're at a point where they're so stiff and sore all the fucking time, and all they will want to do is, like, it'd be sweet if I can just do a fucking lunge without shit hurting, you know? So you got to think of it in a lot of different angles in order to make core training something that you 
can be happy with and also see the long-term effects. So what I want to do today with this episode is put together all my thoughts and ideas on training from learning how to breathe, from what functional abs are, to a whole presentation style of how it looks like to actually you know, put together um, a core routine or core exercises into your program that are not going to you know, F you up down the road. And again, also these core exercises that I'm gonna talk about, sometimes they don't work for a certain individual. A lot of times um, people have different anatomy, different you know, medical backgrounds. People might have wrists and elbows that are always fucked and going into a push-up plank position for example might not work and you have to get creative that's the thing with training is that no matter what program you follow online it's probably not going to get you to your goals specifically it's like you going online typing in how do i save money by you know investing in stocks and someone gives you an idea of how to invest in stocks but really you should want to educate yourself and maybe hire a professional in that realm to kind of give you more guidance. But for some reason with fitness and health, people all think they can do it themselves. But hey, I always use this analogy that, you know, I can probably figure out my own plumbing by going on YouTube and hoping for the best that nothing bursts. But you know, a couple of months down the road, something's gonna give. Um, so enough of me rambling, let's get this compilation video together. I have three episodes um, that all speak on the topic of core training and low back health a little bit and what to do in your programs and workouts to make sure you're creating a strong foundation for your core and also getting visible abs. So here we go, compilation video on core training. So Brisbane, Brisbane, whatever it is. Shout out to everyone in Australia listening to my show. Thank you so much for the support. All right. Today's topic, abs. Six-pack abs that everyone wants but doesn't have the work ethic to get them or doesn't realize the, you know, um, what's it called? The amount of work that is needed to get them. Um, recently, I had someone reach out to me on my Instagram asking for the best six-pack abs exercises. And I was like, damn, I thought we knew better, you guys. But again, this just goes to show, similar to what I was talking about, about my um, conversation with my Lyft driver in San Fran about weight loss. Like, I would like to think that I'm, you know, chipping away at the minutia and the shit that's out there about fitness and health with my show and all my posts I do in social media, but obviously I have not even scratched the surface. So, that being said, we're going to have a little conversation about functional labs and how to get them. Number one, crunches will not give you a six pack not at all I'm sorry no matter how many crunches you do you're not going to get a six pack if you have a layer of adipose tissue aka fat along your abdomen like you don't see an obese man or woman that does a thousand crunches a day just have a shredded midsection and nothing else right it just doesn't that work that way and that brings me to like point 1.1 1. 1. you can't spot reduce you know no matter how many reps you do on a single body part it is not going to tone up or shred off fat the way you think it is all right your body will uh cut down fat the way it's supposed to it goes almost like if you think if you take the top of your head and the bottom of your feet and you start bringing that middle point closer, like the last thing that go is that abdominal, abdominal fat right in the middle that everyone wants gone. So going back to exercise selection, 
one, if you hooked up a bunch of electrodes to your ab muscles, which is your uh, rectus abdominis, your transverse abdominis, and everything basically from the top of your shoulder down to your hips is a core muscle. If you connected all of that to a computer to show how much muscle activity is used during a core exercise, you will see in many, many studies that you can find on like Google Scholar or PubMed that crunches or a sit-up has minimal, you know, ab muscle activation compared to something like a front plank that utilizes more, you know, energy to produce. So when it comes to, you know, the weight loss and fat loss perspective, knowing that I could burn X amount more calories in a workout if I did side planks and front planks compared to crunches, why would I waste my time doing crunches? And then the other caveat is crunches tend to fuck up people's spines. So if you listen to my episode with Dr. Sue McGill probably six months ago now, he is the leading expert in spinal mechanics in the world. He's dedicated probably 40 years of his career to spine mechanics. So this guy knows a thing or two about how the spine works. And he was the first to discover, maybe not the first to discover, but publish it and make it his, um, is that after a certain amount of forward flexion, meaning your spine from a straight position goes into a rounded position forward, so forward flexion. Eventually, the discs on the opposite end push out, and then people get bulging discs, a.k.a. low back pain. In a world that we live in today, especially with COVID, if you're still stuck at home doing nothing, you are sitting for long periods of time, So let's say pre-COVID times, you sit in your car for 45 minutes driving to work. You sit at your desk 8 to 10 hours. You then go back into your car, drive home for an hour or more because of traffic. Then you sit down at your dinner table to eat. And then you sit down to watch Netflix, Disney+, Plus, whatever other streaming service you have. And then you go to sleep. So probably 90% of your day... (laughs) is you sitting in a forward flex position. Why would you want to further take your body into a forward flex position like a crunch, which is gonna add more stress to not only your low back, your upper back, your neck, your hips, everything. It would make more sense to do the opposite, right? So why feed you know, a fire more gasoline? So that being said, there's other functional ways, and I'm air quoting functional because there's a whole movement online that, you know, if you're not functionally training, it's fucking terrible and you're going to explode if you don't. You can still do traditional bicep curls and not explode. But anyway, things that prevent flexion, rotation, Lateral flexion and extension are the best exercises for your low back and your abs. So something like a front plank, side plank, and all their variations work very well. A cable or band anti-rotation press works really well. Cable chops and lifts work really well. Ab rollouts, stability ball saws, like any of those things, basically any core exercise that's not a crunch is a good thing to do. Anything that prevents, that forces your spine to stay neutral essentially and fight rotational forces is a good thing and that's what you want to aim for. That being said, you're going to recruit more muscle fibers, burn more calories and get you closer to those six pack abs that you want. Now that we have the exercise portion covered, we need to look at dietary changes. To get lean enough to see a six pack, you're looking at, for men, probably being in a sub, 
7% body fat. And in order to get there means a lot of sacrifice. And for women, it's about 12, 11%, I believe. I haven't trained a a woman competing for bodybuilding or figure in a long time. Um, So that being said, essentially, you need to eat clean 99% of the time to get those abs that you're looking for. Meaning, not binge drinking on the weekend, no binge eating, no, you know, oh, I'm going to go out for lunch today because I forgot lunch at home. You literally have to calculate every single calorie you put into your mouth to ensure that you don't go over your calories for the day. So when I say tracking calories, that means also weighing every gram and morsel of food you put into your gullet. And do that for at least three to eight months, depending on where you're at, to see those abs pop out. And now you have to think about, can you do that for the rest of your life to have a six pack? Is it really that important, right? There's nothing wrong with being fit as a man at like 10% body fat. You're still pretty muscular. You have a flat stomach, but you're not shredded like you're going to go on to a cover of a magazine. Because are you really going to be that much more happy dropping another 4% in order to see abs? Probably not. You know, how much more value will that give you into your life to get that? You know what I mean? Like, most of the time it's not worth it. As as long as you're like, I, I guess if you were competing, that's the only time when you would do it. But if you're an average Joe that fuck, has two to three kids, full-time job, you're in your mid-40s, most likely getting a six-pack is not going to be high on the priority list, but going, you know, 10 to 12% body fat, looking fit and lean, but not shredded on the abdominal area is okay. Like, who are you trying to impress with your shredded abs? You know what I mean? Um, But that goes to say, like, is it impossible? No. If you have the right environment. Now imagine if your spouse or significant other also is a workout fiend like yourself and likes to track their calories and weigh their food and does it with you every single day. It makes it a lot easier to follow that. You know, to a point where when you go on vacation, you're working out every single day when you go on vacation. Or you know, you're, you, you're on your own, you're single, and all you do is work out and eat properly, then yeah, those are the situations where it works pretty well. But if you're a person that's like a social butterfly that likes to go out for drinks and dinners and lunches and things like that, it's probably not going to happen. You just got to be realistic with yourself, right? Like, here's an example. I'm in the fitness industry. I don't have a six pack. I have a flat stomach. But, you know, am I going to shred myself down further to give up things like cheesecake that I really like, pizza nights with my wife, you know, making sushi with my wife and eating it? Am I going to say no to like, because, you know, summer's around the corner, going out to get ice cream? Like, fuck that. No, I want to enjoy those things. Why would I give those things up just to have a shredded six pack? So I take a photo and put it on my Instagram and that's it. Like, it's really unrealistic. But I get it. A lot of people want to get there and you can, but you have to sacrifice a lot in your life to get there. You know, the people you see that are shredded are like the professionals of fitness, if that makes sense. Like, I can go play basketball every single day, but I'm not going to be as good as a LeBron James or Michael Jordan. You know, I can be pretty good, but I'm not going to be that great like them. So similar here, like if someone decides to start working out, for some reason they have this expectation in their head that they're going to look like 
fitness professionals, like bodybuilding pros, like no, like they dedicate their entire life to look like that, right? They literally give up going to their family's outings for birthdays because they can't eat any of the food or they go and they bring their little Tupperware container of exactly 33 grams of whatever and 127 grams of this all weighed out in a perfect little container and they eat that, right? You need to first figure out if chasing six pack abs is actually worth the time and work in your life. Like if you ask any bodybuilder that's shredded how many how many hours they spend into the gym, like Arnold Schwarzenegger spent about two to three hours a day in the gym. Every day. Like that's almost a full time job. And I've known a lot of um, fitness models and um, both male and female that do it for a living. And essentially they get a phone call and go and their agents like, hey, you have a photo shoot in five weeks. Here's the details and go. So essentially you need to be fit five weeks out or six weeks out before a shoot. So there's no like cheating at all. Like they don't go out drinking. They don't go out to eat at all. So you need to really hone in on what's really important in your life. All right. I think I covered that topic pretty well. If you have any more questions about it, let me know. We're going to do another screen share presentation thing. So um, for those listening, um, 100% hit the show notes and watch the video because we're going to go through um, a couple of photos, demos of exercises and like things like that to kind of get my point across on what we're going to talk about today, which I'm super psyched because it is a topic that I I'm super passionate about in the sense that so many people still do stupid shit in the gym and I, you know, no matter how much I try to hammer this out, um, to say the least, it still pisses me off. But <laughs> anyway, we're going to get into it right away because I want to keep this under 30 minutes because I know I'm going to talk forever about this. So we're going to talk about functional core training. So what the hell does that mean, first of all? Um, if you are an individual that still believes that doing nonstop like crunches is going to, you know, get the aesthetic look that you're hoping for, you're probably not going to get there. You're probably going to end up with some sort of uh, low back pain, um, stiffness, uh, buckling, things like that. And we're going to kind of go through, um, Number one, why crunches or any kind of flexion-based core exercises is not the greatest for you. And my kind of like go-to when it comes to anything spine-related, core-related, is looking at the best in the industry when it comes to that topic, right? It's just like if you were... A bodybuilder and you wanted to get big freaking biceps to have like huge peaks on them you know you'd probably want to find another bodybuilder that is known for that like has a lot a lot of experience and who usually comes to mind Arnold Schwarzenegger so you would probably want to listen to him when it comes to you know building huge biceps um, that stick out but for some reason, when it comes to other things in the fitness industry, people just go on Instagram and look at, oh, that person looks fit. I'm going to follow what they do. Um, whereas if you go down the rabbit hole of finding experts in the field, like Dr. Sue McGill, when it comes to the spine, people still don't tend to listen. And this dude has probably had, I don't know, at least 35 years of experience and research when it comes to spine mechanics and 
what works for the spine and what doesn't seems like you should probably listen to that guy. So let's go through this rabbit hole of functional core training and uh, kind of go from there. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully I don't have any hiccups like I did before. Uh, okay. I also want to, Somehow I'm unmuted. I muted myself and unmuted myself. <laughs> I was just going to say, I kind of want to make my little screen here a little bit bigger. Um, so what we're going to look at is a couple things. Number one, um, let's all look at this first. If it's going to pop up. All right. All right. All right. All right. Don't worry about the dude on the left here where, you know, he's showcasing good posture to desk because that's a whole nother topic. But what I want people to kind of look at is the guy on the right. I'm trying to move myself out of that. There you go. This, we all know and can probably agree that is not the greatest posture for a prolonged time. So when you look at forward flexion, so we have flexion of the T-spine and lumbar spine and like that whole poke neck thing because we're all like this on our laptops looking. <laughs> we all know that's not the best. We all know that when you sit for way too long, things get tight, things get painful. You want to stand up, you want to move around and stuff like that. So what is... This is how I make my point clear. What is the difference between this guy sitting and where are we? This guy. I'm happy that I can do this. Does this guy doing crunches look similar to this guy sitting? Looks basically the same. So here's my point. The standard general population person will wake up, go into their car, commute for an hour sitting, get into their desk at work and sit for eight to 10 hours, then go back into their car and sit for another hour in traffic, and then come home, sit down at a dinner table, and then finish the night off sitting on the couch watching whatever show that's on or whatever is good enough to turn off the mind. So probably 70% of our day, we're in this forward flex position. So why would a general population person decide that, hey, on Mondays and Wednesday nights, I'm going to go to the gym to get fit, work on my health. And I'm going to finish my workout with crunches that promotes the same type of posture as me sitting all day. So already there, many of you um, who don't know this would be like, fuck, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So let's go even further. If you look at people doing crunches, where do people usually fatigue or feel it first? It's usually like their low back. Research has proved time and time again that our spine does not like repeated forward flexion. What happens is things like, let me see, let me see. Oh, this is actually perfect too. I didn't even plan this. This spine our lumbar spine here is already in flexion. So I wonder if I can actually, mm, it doesn't get bigger, but oh well. When we look at our vertebrae here, and I'm already doing this hunch posture because I'm like trying to look at the, the thing. Um, we have these discs in between each vertebrae. Now imagine if you take a sandwich that's loaded with stuff, that like fucking loaded with a lot of meat, a lot of tomatoes, pickles, onions, everything. And you're holding it on one end because you're going to eat it like this. 
and you're like squishing everything so it doesn't fall through and falls onto your hand. And then you have the top portion of the, uh, the sandwich that's opened and everything is pushing this way. Or you're one of those people that holds a sandwich right dead center. You take a bite and everything from the bottom slips out, right? So you have all this pressure on one end and you're pushing all the other stuff on the inside between the two pieces of bread out towards your plate or onto your hands. So our spine is very, very similar. So imagine all these discs are the inside of your sandwich, the delicious stuff. And our vertebrae, say let's go L5 and L4 are our two pieces of sandwiches. And oh, two pieces of bread, sorry. And we squish one side, all the stuff comes up this way. So your disc actually pushes out. So that's called a bulging disc and a really, really freaking common. And what's kind of like all in front of here, a lot of fucking nerve endings. Once that disc gets pushed out, it could push against one of those. And now you have low back pain, like the sharp shooting pain, um, the sharp shooting kind where it's nerve related and nothing that you do helps stretching doesn't help or anything like that. Cause that's again, a whole nother topic. Nerves hate being stretched. What do people with low back pain do first thing in the morning? They want to stretch their low back, which is like the worst thing you can do. So that individual that keeps sitting all day, keeps going to the gym, doing um, crunches and other exercises that just other crunch variations that um, end up putting your lumbar spine into flexion, you're just like feeding the fire, the fuel to the fire to make your low back really pissed off. So the other thing that I always get, so sometimes I'll talk to a coach that still believes that, you know, uh, crunches is still a great core exercise. And they'll make the argument, well, you know, if you bend your knees, you're not going to have your um, low back involved and your lumbar spine will be neutral. I'm like, okay, well, let's go down that pathway. So if I get rid of this photo, so kind of similar to like this guy, right? Like it kind of looks fairly neutral. So for that person that sits like this for a long, long time, our body tends to like to stay in that posture because this is what happens. Our body adapts to whatever stress you put on it. So an example is you go to the gym, you do a bicep curl with a 15 pound dumbbell. You do 10 reps. The next day you're kind of sore. So the next week you go back to the gym, you repeat your program or workout, and you decide to go back to that bicep curl. And the moment you start doing bicep curls with the same weight, same reps it becomes easier. Like your body adapted to that stress, everything repaired because your nervous system goes, okay, the next time we do this, we're going to make sure that we're ready for it. So now you have to follow the principle of progressive overload. You have to do more volume to get that training effect, right? So our bodies are really efficient at adapting to what you throw at it. So it goes for everything we do. So in this case, when we sit Every single day, our body wants to get really efficient at doing it. So it's going to help you, you know, in a shitty way to get you more efficient at sitting. So in order to be in this position, like your hips are in flexion. So imagine if this guy's feet or legs were straight and now we bend them to be in a sitting, a sitting position that is flexion of the hips. So your body goes, well, you have these things called the hip flexors. I'm going to keep them tight to make you more efficient at sitting because it requires hip flexion. So where am I going with this? Let's look at our psoas major, which is our hip flexor. Oh, perfect. I love this view. All right. So hip flexor, and it goes right to where our femur is and our femoral neck. And it attaches, oh, look at this. Look at all these vertebrae, basically L1 to L5. Our hip flexor goes right towards that lumbar region. 
So that person that sits all day, all of this stuff is super fucking tight and it connects to our lumbar spine and it pulls down on it. So now you have tension on the lumbar uh, region and it's kind of that like trifecta almost for getting to that point where there's so many things that we're doing that is constantly feeding the fire to more low back pain, right? So you bending your legs to help you with crunches is not actually doing anything, right? You're still going to get lumbar flexion or flexion in, you know, the um, higher vertebrae, say like T12, T11, whatever it is. And you're still going to promote those discs being pushed and squeezed into positions that you don't want. Now, say I'm chatting with another lovely coach out there that believes that our spine needs to be um, mobile, which it does. But I'm always speaking for the general population. So there's something called a Jefferson curl. Let's go look at what that looks like. Uh, This guy. So the Jefferson curl... I don't know who invented it. Some dude named Jefferson. You start in a straight um, position, like just standing with a kettlebell barbell. It's traditionally done with a barbell. And you slowly lower your spine until you get past your toes. So this is a great example of what your spine absolutely fucking hates if you're a um, general population person. Loaded forward flexion. Research has time and time again shown that when you load flexion, you have a really high chance of injuring yourself like royally. And this is a thing too that I've seen um, in clinic and in practice with uh, clients is that with low back pain, it comes out of nowhere. You have no idea where, um, what triggered it unless it was like, I picked up my kid and my entire back gave out. Most of the time, like low back pain will like creep up out of nowhere. And it could be what you do in the gym in combination with your lifestyle and weird movements that you did in the morning or something like that. So, you know, in theory, this could be a good exercise for some, but not many are, you know, meant to do that. So I just wanted to show that, you know, people out there will say like, oh, the Jefferson curl is a great way to build a strong spine. But it's really easy to claim um, anything online, especially on Instagram. Like there's so much bullshit on there. And I get frustrated when people will like send me a video and be like, oh, like, what do you think of this? And I'm like, people just spewing out bullshit as always. But anyway, Let's look at something else here. I wanted to share. I'm kind of going all over the place, but I think we can kind of agree now that forward flexion, just like this guy sitting, is not going to be the best choice for core exercises for the general population. Um, There are time and places when you might have to train flexion And the only time I can think about that is a boxer or a mixed martial artist because they're in forward flexion a lot. But I've spoken to so many top performance coaches on that topic specifically. And they're like, why would I want to train more flexion on these guys who are already doing so much flexion on the floor, on the mat, whatever, you know, type of martial art that they're practicing. It makes no sense. Like you loading flexion when you're already doing flexion hours on end during the week, you're just overloading it. It's just like you deciding to do bench press five days a week. You're going to overload that pattern and other things are going to, you know, suffer. So core training is kind of the same. So what I want to go through next is, um, actually there's one more photo I wanted to show Uh, here. This is another example of um, 
the Jefferson curl, but I've seen so many times where people actually deadlift like this. And I'm like, just why, 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 why? You need to teach yourself how to keep a neutral spine. So if you actually go through the works of Dr. Stuart McGill, our spine is um, designed to fight motion, right? Like in order to generate force and power and velocity and all those things, you need to be able to create stiffness and stability um, proximally, which means like within my, my core to be able to create distal stability and power and strength, right? So this guy here is not demonstrating that at all, at all. But if you were trying to train for some god awful reason, the Jefferson curl, then sure, this is where you should do it. But again, there's a time and place for everything. For the general population, it's like, like you you ride your bike on the weekends for fun, but then your friend is like a downhill mountain biker that's professional, and they're like, you should come do a black diamond run. Like that's literally the same thing. Like the chances of you getting injured and falling on your face and breaking your like collarbone is pretty high. So like you got to kind of know where you're at. And that's where like a whole nother topic of like, you got to stop listening to your ego and stuff like that. So what else did I have in here before I kind of go in? Um, again, like I'll, I'll bring this up. Like if you look at our lumbar spine in this photo, like this whole section right here is designed to be stable, right? And if you look at biomechanics or like how every single part of our body is designed to work, it would make sense to train to enhance that, right? Like our legs are meant to run. So why would you do movements that don't resemble any kind of running movements or utilizing your muscles um, that would, you know, help in creating a movement like running, right? Like it's just like, it's literally common sense. Like if your elbow is meant to bend, um, like flex and extend, it would make sense to train movements like that rather than like, no, I'm going to train my elbow joint, like my neck, like it doesn't make sense. So it's the same thing. Um, the other thing I wanted to show is the rest of the spine. So we know now that our lumbar spine is supposed to be, um, let me get rid of this guy. Um, where are we? Where are we? Where are we? Here we go. Um, our lumbar spine is designed to be stable. So when we look at um, the rest of our vertebrae along our spine, our thoracic spine, which is this junction right here, is designed to be super mobile. This is where we should be moving and within our hip junction. Our cervical spine is also designed for movement, but also stability at the same time, which is a whole nother thing which we may or may not get into today. Um, so, if we know that our lumbar spine is supposed to be stable, our thoracic spine is supposed to be mobile, how do we train our core, that's not crunches, to one, get the aesthetic look that we're hoping for, and number two, preventing any kind of low back pain or injury and utilizing functional core exercises. So number one, like a lot of times when people want to continue doing crunches, it's because they want to get the aesthetic look. So if you look at EMG studies where they literally attach like electrodes to you and things like that to see how much muscle activation, like comparing a crunch to a front plank, the crunch is quite low, right? Whereas the front plank requires a lot more stability, which requires a lot more muscle fibers, which requires more calories to be used for energy expenditure, which means that you're going to get closer to your fat loss goals. So we're going to go down the rabbit hole of functional core exercises. 
So where I like to start is breathing. So we're going to go back to my lovely, lovely um, YouTube page, which by the way, you guys should subscribe because I post a lot, like a lot. Um, and, you know, if you need a little library of exercises or ideas or demos or tutorials, like this is where you should go or like even watching this video. Um, so we're going to play this guy. And the reason why I want to show this is that in order to create, you know, stiffness, you need to be able to utilize your diaphragm like I am in this video. So as you can see, my chest does not move at all. And then look at how much that diaphragm expands and then is able to come back down to resting. So this teaches your body how to create stability. I kind of look at breathing as your first domino piece of the puzzle to create core stability. So a lot of times when people, when I get them into this position, they kind of just breathe through that top hand. They have, they've learned a new way to breathe with their chest. And then you wonder why people's traps are super tight and their neck is super tight. So when you create intra-abdominal pressure, it all starts with breathing, right? So when you look at, again, lumbar spine, you remember how we had the photo of our hip flexors, right? So if you look at my hip and then the psoas major like comes up to here, passes the lumbar spine, it kind of goes where our diaphragm is. So if you know that someone sits, they have tight hip flexors and you know that the hip flexor kind of runs close to the diaphragm and you don't know how to use your diaphragm at all, it would probably make sense that if you trained your diaphragm to move more effectively, it can release some tension on the um, hip flexor. And then in return, your low back won't feel as tight. So our diaphragm can expand in kind of like a 360 degree um, expansion. So not only is it able to push out, but it can also go, um, on the side, so uh, sideline breathing. So this I like to utilize kind of with patients who are, you know, getting better at breathing and get them on a sideline position and place their hands here and try to expand in this position. This is very, very difficult. I've seen with a lot of people that sometimes they'll end up being able to do one side and the other can't. So now we already have an energy leak. So how are you supposed to create stability when you can't even breathe into one section of your, you know, core, your torso, right? And then if you look at from this side, if you look at my thumb, like it expands, like I can breathe into the, my back essentially. So that would probably play a huge role in creating low back stiffness and like safety if I'm going to deadlift, right? Like it makes sense. So once I teach my body how to breathe, now I know how to create core stability. I know how to create stiffness. And I like to go into what our, you know, um, spine, AKA or lumbar spine is designed to do. Why is this up here? Hmm. I knew I was going to run into something. Well, I'm just going to do this. <laughs> oh, there we go. So if you look at what our core is designed to do to protect our spine, it's supposed to fight movement. So what are the movements that we need to fight off? So there's flexion, there's extension, there's lateral flexion, and there's rotation and hip flexion. So some basic things would be like a front plank or a side plank, but things like an anti-rotation press, which I absolutely love. Let's go look at one of those. Again, so many freaking tutorials. But you know what, let's look at this one. It's more of an advanced exercise, but of course this would happen adds. I did not think this would happen, but so I'm doing a half kneeling 
uh, anti-rotation press. So once I press out like this, and I don't know why the video is terrible quality. Actually, well, hopefully I, I get a different angle. Let's continue watching. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm not, it's not going to continue, but the moment I press out, the cable, and you can't see this invisible line, is pulling my body inwards. So, in a half kneeling position, what I love about it compared to standing, this right glute of mine needs to squeeze. And how many people want better looking glutes? So, here you go. There's an isometric right away. Also, how many people I've been told by their physio or Cairo that their glutes are not strong enough and their hamstrings are super dominant and they get low back pain when they do a glute bridge. So already I'm like tackling two things. You're also teaching your, this right hip how to stabilize. How many people have had hip pain, knee pain, ankle pain due to weak hips that can't stabilize? All right, so we got three things. So now we're gonna do a press with that cable and we're extending the lever because like just standing here in that half kneel position, yeah, I'm getting pulled out and I can learn how to stabilize. But the moment I start pressing out, I have a longer lever, which requires more for me to stabilize. So I'm going to create that stability. And then, you know, something like this that I've, I do with people that start off, I will add that front raise. So not only am I fighting rotation, I'm also fighting extension. So the moment I'm bringing my, um, my hands with the cable up towards the ceiling, going into flexion, I'm fighting um, extension because if I go all the way up towards the ceiling, I, I'm going to be in an extended position where, you know, it'll be easy to utilize my low back, which I didn't even mention in a half kneel position, it's really hard to extend through lumbar spine. So it's another way to teach how to utilize hips instead of low back and, you know, reteach your body how to utilize your hips. Also, this other exercise, when you get to the very top, you're also finding antilateral flexion. So in this one exercise, I'm teaching my body so many different things to bulletproof it, to ensure that I'm not injuring my low back down the road. So let's get out of here and look at some other core exercises that I absolutely love. Uh, all right. So one of my favorite pieces of equipment is the TRX. So number one, when you place yourself in a TRX, like I am right now, oh man, I miss those uh, Converse shoes. Anyway, um, there's a lot of unstable positions because like these handles move all the time. So I have to create a lot of stiffness, which my lumbar spine really, really likes. And I'm actually happy that I chose this because number one, let's hip flexion is one way to train our core effectively. But now look at my lumbar spine. Like there is some flexion in here. So let me try to stop. Boom. Flexion. So remember how I said our spine does not like flexion. The moment, like this is the cool thing about our industry, but this is also an, a kind of a shitty thing because people end up, um, taking it too far and spewing up bullshit. The moment you know the rules, that's when you can break them. So yes, I'm putting my lumbar into flexion, but it's not loaded. This exercise is an advanced exercise that most general population people won't be using, but this also comes down to a coaching thing. So you know, us coaches should also be coached. So if I had a trainer and they saw that, they should be good enough to be like, hey, keep your hips lower, make sure you're not rounding. But then if you look at my anatomy and 
the exception of the rule. If I'm able to get into that position, I should be able to train in that position. So there's a lot of, you know, here's one way of doing it in my industry. And then here's another way of doing it. So there's always an exception to the rule. So if I saw a client of mine who has low back pain or just like a client of mine that has low back pain in general, I wouldn't give them this exercise. If I had say a yogi that is super flexible and their spine is like a freaking like noodle, I wouldn't be worried about something like this. If I had a general population person and I want them to give uh, this sort of exercise doing um, hip flexion, I would get them not to drive their knees as far as possible. I would get them into a position where it's at 90 degrees, which I'm going to show an example of. I wonder how we are on time. I'm going to end up talking forever. So here, I think I might have even shown this last time, but so if you look at me here, doing a slow motion mountain climber. Hip flexion, just like the atomic crunch. But now look at my lumbar spine. Super neutral, super stable. And I hold this for a while to teach my body how to stabilize hip flexion, right? Neutral. The other video is just a great example of how there's always exceptions to the rule. Right. So this is what I actually would teach to a client of mine or a patient. Learn how to stabilize hip flexion with your lumbar spine. Right. This is functional core training at its finest. If I had to like chew something. Right. So now we went over like breathing. Um, we went over like basic planks, um, hip flexion. And now I also want to show um anti-lateral flexion. Now we also did uh, anti-rotation, so fighting any kind of rotation. Um, farmer carry. So a single arm farmer carry. So if you think of being able to pick up an object like here and resisting lateral flexion, like one, you have to be really careful because I don't give... Um, a single arm farmer carry right off the bat because it places a lot of tension on the opposite side of the low back. So like your QL and things like that. So you want to be really, really careful doing something like this really, really close to where you, you know, start out on your fitness journey. So learning how to create stiffness in the very beginning and then challenging like this, super functional. I love carries such a functional exercise. Um, the other thing is any kind of dead bug variation. So I'm going to showcase one of my favorite variations of the dead bug. Uh, da, 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 this guy. So sometimes using an implement like a yoga block and crushing, like you can see like my death grip of my fingers, like I'm crushing that thing like i want to break it that teaches this area stiffness and stability and now i am teaching my body how to fight one extension but also hip flexion because like if you look at that that's hip flexion but just in a different position and that's the cool thing about training is like okay how can i do hip flexion i can do a dead bug i can do a mountain climber i can but sky's the limit of how you can do this Right. And this is where like the art comes into um, creating a program for the individual. And this is a whole nother like thing that we can get into is why people need to get an assessment done, which I've done a podcast episode about to make training specific to the individual and not just like a cookie cutter program. Now, the other thing is like rotary stability. I really hope I'm not going over time, but, you know, it is what it is. Bird dogs. One of my favorite ways, and I feel like I might have invented this exercise. So if someone finds it out, finds out online, someone else is doing this. So um, why is it speeding up? 
or maybe I did that anyway. So a traditional bird dog is like the arm in front extending forward and then the other leg um, extending back. So what I find a lot of times, so this is how it looks on this direction. Um, people kind of just go through the bird dog, just through the motion and you know, it is what it is. Like they don't think about it. So I try to find ways to create, you know, exercise like the bird dog where people feel it right away. And they're like, Oh fuck, this is really hard. So number one, when you're in a, qu a quadruped position, like you have all four points of contact, the reason why the bird dog should be difficult. And now you're on only two points of contact with your hand and leg down. Right. And that creates an unstable surface and you need to stabilize it. But I find a lot of times people end up just using lumbar spine to extend that back leg if they're going to kick back. And then they end up like extending their arm up and they end up arching and it's just terrible. So I thought of, okay, number one, I'm going to make an isometric. So when I do this bird dog variation, I hold this position for 10 seconds and then come back in. And in that position, I'm telling people like, drive that fist even higher, drive that knee even higher. So they're trying to get more tension, more feedback, and they feel it right away. But the other thing too, what I thought about this exercise is like, what are two other things that people are terrible at? They're terrible at activating this stuff on the hip, like the, those external rotators, right? So the stuff that like lateral lunges, step ups, like stuff that requires a lot of single leg strength all comes from those hip stabilizers. So people are terrible at it. So I'm like, why don't I add like hip flexion and hip abduction and hold it isometrically for 10 seconds. The other thing that people are terrible at are um, shoulder mobility in general, especially external rotation. So I have this arm in abduction, external rotation. I'm telling people to like use their fist to like drive it back as much as possible. And they feel it right away. So now I have three things. So like core stability from the bird dog position, uh, hip stability and shoulder stability, all working all at the same time. Right. So this is the kind of stuff that people should be doing. And it blows my mind that people still fall into those patterns of like, oh, I'm just going to go do crunches or like whatever, go on a machine that does the crunch for me. Like, stop, just stop. Doing this stuff will bulletproof you for life. And then you can challenge yourself beyond things that you could ever imagine. So I'm going to stop it there because I feel like I could talk for like hours on this topic, but hopefully that sheds some light on functional core training and how to protect your low back and what our backs are designed to do and things like that. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, thank you so much for listening and watching. And for those who were just listening this whole time, the topic today is intra abdominal pressure, bracing your core, breathing, whatever you want to call it. Because currently I'm writing this section in my book and I didn't really touch on it as in-depth as I should in my first book. And I always feel bad when I start writing a section of my book that kind of expands on my previous one. And I'm like, fuck, why did I talk about this? Why didn't I give more at the time? But again, as we grow up, because, you know, I still feel like I'm 16 years old in high school. Um we learn more and we can give more to the world. So that's the situation. But breathing is so important, obviously, because we don't, if we don't breathe, we die. Um, but when it comes to exercise, it is so vital to one for performance, but two for creating like a safety net around our body, especially our spine. So when you look at a sport like powerlifting, they, in my opinion, have one of the best bracing strategies for their spines to ensure that when they lift 800 pounds off the ground in a deadlift, that their, you know, what's it called? Their spines don't explode and shoot out into not into, onto the gym floor. So when I am in the clinic and I have a patient in front of me that is needed to learn how to properly create a diaphragmic breath, 
I first assess them, and nine out of ten times, they breathe with their chest. All of us fall into this pattern. Our lives are dealt with so much stress, and we end up becoming chest breathers. And then our traps and our scalenes and all these muscles around our neck and shoulders end up becoming hypertonic and they get super tight and we can't do anything about it no matter how much massage you get how much theragun bullshit you do to yourself um they just are overactive and then you sit in a desk all day or in a car like i am right now and again you're stressed you're you're clenching you're breathing with your chest and your diaphragm doesn't move and just like anything, if you don't use it, you lose it. I say this all the time. Now, imagine, because again, your diaphragm is a muscle, right? If you don't use a muscle for a long time, it loses its ability to function the way it should. It doesn't go to sleep or doesn't get act. It's not activating or whatever that bullshit that you hear. It simply means it goes into a state of atrophy, it's weaker, and it doesn't fire or function the way it should. So imagine if, you know, you never did bicep curls or never bent your elbow for like six months. It would be awkward and weird and you would almost like forget how to like move your arm into a bicep um, position. So just like your diaphragm. When I'm in the clinic and I'm asking people to breathe through their belly, it's almost like their mind can't connect to their diaphragm and there's this weird disconnect. And there's things where I'll get people like, okay, well, place one hand on your belly, one hand on your chest and try to breathe into the bottom hand. And even then, like their breathing pattern's kind of off. They can't really figure out how to make that connection. So then the next layer is like, okay, I want you to place your hands at the bottom of your rib cage and place it place it at the bottom of that rib cage. I'm like repeating myself, I'm an idiot right now. Anyway, um, so the front of your fingers are gonna be at the front of your belly. The little like crease between your index finger and your thumb is gonna be surrounding kind of where your obliques are. And then your thumb is gonna be pushed into the back of your back, kind of like where your kidneys sit. And every inhale, you should be able to fill your entire grip. And I call this like the Homer Simpson chokehold grip. So if you ever watch the Simpsons, um, you know that Homer chokes Bart. <laughs> anyway, and I just, I just like to use that analogy. And ideally, you should be able to fill that chokehold. And a lot of times people have a lot of troubles. They still kind of breathe into their chest. So I'm like, okay, every exhale, you know, as you breathe in and exhale, everything kind of collapses. And I tell people in that chokehold position, push against your waist. And then every inhale and exhale, every single time you exhale, you want to push a little bit further. And it kind of comes down to this concept. If I went to over through this freaking video and try to push you over, your natural instinct is to resist against me, right? So if I'm pushing against my diaphragm, the natural instinct for my diaphragm is to push against my hands. Again, your diaphragm does not have a brain and it's like, oh, fuck, someone's pushing me. It's just like a reaction, right? And it's a great way to teach it. Sometimes that doesn't work. So what I'll do is place a sandbag or sand bell that's about 10 pounds and place it on someone's belly. And then now that we have a kind of like feedback textile thing on us gives us a little bit more sensory information and then with the added weight it gives you a little bit more stimulation that oh I have something and I need to push against it so now when I ask a patient or client to um, every time you inhale I want you to, to think of pushing that sandbag or sand bell um, up towards the ceiling it works beautifully now what this does creates this kind of domino effect of core function and core stability. When I lift something heavy, I want to create as much intra-abdominal pressure as possible to protect my spine. When I don't do that, I have now shear forces and compressive forces going into my vertebrae, and over time, that's going to fuck up my shit, and I'm going to have low back pain, hip pain, whatever it is. So, when I 
properly utilize a diaphragmic breath, it starts this like waterfall, domino effect, like I said earlier, of this beautifully orchestrated core contraction. When we don't have function of our diaphragm at all, and you're a chest breather, where does that stability come from? Nowhere. So now imagine you're in a gym, trying to push yourself, lifting heavier weights. And honestly, this is why a lot of people end up getting like hernias, low back pain, pulling their whole back out and crap like that. And it all starts with this foundational thing, our breath, you know, and going back to that kind of like stressful um, scenario that we all live in. And because we're not utilizing our diaphragm, that's heightening our stress response. Because when you look at, again, our bodies are beautifully designed. Like, it's so well designed. When we utilize our diaphragm, it stimulates a cranial nerve called your vagus nerve. What is that responsible for? De-stressing your fucking body. So now imagine you going to your job every single day, sitting at a desk, and constantly in that stress response and you're not utilizing your diaphragm that's naturally designed to help you to chill the fuck out hell yes your body is gonna fucking hate you now take that a step further and you repeat that for like 10 years because you're at the stage of your life where you have to work all the fucking time and you're not exercising and this stress response just gets worse and worse and worse. And now it's affecting your sleep. And now you can't utilize your body's na- another natural designed uh, thing where it helps you de-stress and your sleep is broken up or it's not as deep. And you're just in this vicious cycle of shit and you can't get out of it. And no wonder our bodies are just like holding on for dear life to figure out its shit to move on and live and be happy and healthy, right? And this is where exercise comes in. This is where exercise is such a powerful thing. Like, it fixes everything. Like, it's ridiculous. But we need to learn how to utilize our foundational patterns, like breathing, to actually get the benefit of exercise. Because a lot of times people are like, oh, I'm going to go like balls to the wall every time I go to the gym. And you end up fucking yourself over because your body can only take so much stress. And again, it goes back to this whole diaphragm thing. If this diaphragm is not breathing and moving and stimulating that vagus nerve to help you de-stress from all the stressors of life, then you're kind of fucked. Especially if you're going to the gym doing burpees and med ball slams and ropes and then sprints and all that other shit. It's probably not going to, you know, go towards your favor of seeing the benefit of exercise. It's probably going to make things worse. That being said, as we utilize a full-blown diaphragmic breath, we can then create stability around our spine. I like to utilize the analogy that stability is kind of like a safety net. The moment we create stability in our body, then we can get proximal stability with our arms and legs to create movement if we can't sorry distally again words proximal which is our diaphragm here core if we can't create proximal stability then we can't have distal mobility and stability meaning if i want to run and throw and do a kettlebell snatch If this guy in the center here does not work, then those things are not going to, one, look um, good, aka your form. And when you actually do it, it's going to create more problems than solutions. That being said, when we do a proper diaphragmic breath, I like to use the analogy of an unopened Coke can. And I've used this reference analogy so many times and I'm pretty sure I stole it from Dr. Uh, Charlie Weingroff that used this analogy probably like nine years ago now so if you imagine 
our torso is kind of like a cylinder, right? Our diaphragm not only pushes forward when we take a deep breath, it pushes out to the side and also behind us, creating a cylinder effect of low back stability, torso stability, whatever you want to call it. For example, we take an unopened Coke can, place it on the floor. You could step on it and place your entire body weight on it. It does not go anywhere. Why? The can itself, because it's designed like a cylinder, it's a strong, solid foundation. But on top of that, we have liquid inside and also a compressive air. So like the um, carbonation that's stuck in there. So now when you add low to it, it is a strong little thing that can take, you know, if I step on it, it's 160 pounds, right? Like that's pretty impressive. Now let's take a second and open up that Coke can, pour out the liquid just a little bit, like well, one fourth of a cup. Now step on it. It's going to crush underneath that weight of mine or yours, whatever you want to imagine. Now, that's what happens when we can't effectively utilize our diaphragm. And then we go into a heavy lift like a deadlift, you know, right there. And then you're not going to feel any kind of pain. I always say to uh, patients like injury happens when the amount of force that enters the tissue yields when the tissue is like, holy fuck, that's enough. Boom. Right. Or how an injury happens is repetitive stress to the tissue. And again, it yields to that and goes, fuck, that's it. I'm tearing apart. When we don't utilize our diaphragm properly and create that low back stability that's needed to deadlift off the ground, we're just like slashing away at a vertebrae or tendons or tissues, everything. And eventually we go, holy fuck, why is my back hurt? Right? Take that a step further to more dynamic exercises like running. Let's, and I like to use this analogy, like Usain Bolt. He has such a great and like efficient system of being able to contract, relax, contract, relax. The best athletes in the world can contract and relax their muscles faster than anyone else. And that's why they excel. So imagine when Usain Bolt runs his 100 meter sprint, the moment that his foot touches the ground every single time, his entire body creates stability, that stiffness, that intra-abdominal pressure because of his diaphragm. The moment in a running cycle where both feet leave the ground because you're like literally like floating for a second. His entire body is super relaxed, super, you know, like zero muscle activation. But every time his foot touches the ground and has to like generate power, full body, body stiffness, right? Contract, relax, contract, relax. His diaphragm is so well tuned and so well developed that he can contract and relax that quickly. If we, again, we're not all going to be like Usain Bolt, but if we can learn how to tap into the power of our diaphragm where we can contract and relax at the right moments, then we can stay pain-free and our performance will increase. A lot of times when I work with an amateur lifter for the first time and you know they hit a plateau with their deadlift, and they keep saying, like, every time I go heavier, I end up with, like, low back soreness, right? And form aside, if I test their breathing, they're not very good at it, right? A lot of people skip the foundations that they need in order to perform. Now, going from almost like a rehab and postnatal um, perspective, a lot of uh, women who come out of pregnancy have a real tough time um, getting their core strength back because they have one, they have this pressure to get back 
to their like pre baby weight type of thing. You know, they have all this pressure from society and this made up narrative in their head that for some reason, after you give birth right away, you need to like look the same way you did. Like, first of all, like one, you literally just pushed a human being out of you. I think you deserve some time to, you know, rest and let your body naturally heal. Like, number one. (laughs) Number two, there are so many, like, mommy programs and boot camps out there that choose exercises way too advanced for a postnatal mother. Number one, every pregnancy is different. Everyone heals differently. Everyone has different anatomy. Everyone has a different um, labor process. So throwing in things like burpees and crunches and mountain climbers is probably not the best idea. And again, pelvic floor health is something I always talk about, but a lot of times it's not mentioned in the world of powerlifting and um, men. But pelvic floor strength is huge for these athletes. If you look up um, Chris Duffin from Kabuki Strength out in Portland, I remember chatting with him one time and, and he was saying like the biggest change for him was learning how to utilize his pelvic floor along with his diaphragm in order to perform better at his deadlift and back squat. So if you think about creating that intra-abdominal pressure, that compressed air in the cylinder, if your diaphragm's at the top of your rib cage and your pelvic floor is at the bottom, when these two contract properly, they almost kind of come down on each other, creating more intra-abdominal pressure to create more safety around your spine. And especially for postnatal women who come back to the gym too early or start doing exercises that are too advanced for them and they have zero um, intra-abdominal pressure, they're going to get pain in their low back and hip. Like it's, it's not rocket science. If I don't have stability in the lumbar region, it's going to get fucked really, really badly. And I am like dumbfounded about our industry where I see trainers giving just such shitty exercises to people that are just not ready for them. And again, like, yes, exercise is great for you. But I look at exercise as giving me longevity for my life. Like my personal goal, like I get clients all the time like, oh, like, what are you training for? I'm like, I'm training to be a functional human being so that when I'm 90 years old, I don't need assistance. I want to be able to go outside and take a walk by myself and not rely on, you know, a cane, a walker or a little like scooter thing. I want to be able to walk and live my life at 90. How do I get there? By doing exercises That won't fuck my body. So an example is, I've learned, I think three years ago, broad jumps fucking hate my body. I don't do them anymore. Like, what's the point of doing an exercise that I know is causing me issues? And I went down a rabbit hole to figure that out, right? So now you take all these general population people that are going to gyms, and either figuring their shit out on their own or just following a cookie cutter program. And in that cookie cutter program, maybe say the 10 exercises that are in there, seven are really good for them and three of them are actually making them worse, you know? And exercise is supposed to give you um, better quality of life, better health. But if I am constantly going into a gym where I am doing exercises that are slowly wearing me down and slowly going to pull me out of that environment where I could get the benefit of exercise and now I have to stop because I'm injured, it's going to be this rough like up and down thing where, you know, three months, 
I'm training consistently. Now I have to stop for a month because my back hurts, my knee hurts, whatever it is. Then I come back, but not at full capacity because I'm worried about my injury and whatever else is happening. And then I'm not burning as many calories. I'm not enjoying the workouts anymore. My motivation might go down. And then I'm like, you know what? I've been babying my knee for two months. I'm going to go back to where it was. And then I get injured again. And it's just like this vicious cycle of up and down, up and down. And you will never end up seeing the result or just the benefit of exercise in general because you're constantly in this battle of trying to move and feel better, but you keep doing the wrong things, you know? And it just pains me to see that there's some trainers out there that will train based on their own interests, right? Like, I love using kettlebells as a trainer. But does that mean that every single client that I train uses kettlebells? Fuck no. No. Right? Like, I see it all the time. Like, a trainer that's more athlete based or whatever will start trying to train their clients like athletes but like get it through your head that most people can't train like an athlete unless it's their full-time job and most likely they haven't played a sport like a pro athlete their entire life in order to do those things right so this is a big tangent that I'm going on but it bugs me to see poor choices being made by trainers because usually it's out of their own self-interest and not the interest of their clients. I always tell my clients like you're in charge of your health. I'm just here to kind of guide you in the right direction. This is why I always like ask clients like what do you want to see in your program? A lot of times they're just like you know what I trust you just do your thing but eventually when I keep asking that they'll eventually tell me like you know what I feel like my left leg needs a little bit more stability. Can we do a little bit more hip stability stuff to improve that? 100%. And this is the other thing too, is like a good coach will not only just prescribe exercise, but also teach their client what they need to know. Like I can have a full-blown conversation with my clients and about training and they will understand, you know? They will have they have the ability that you know when we were able to travel and they go to a public gym to train on their own they can spot bad form they can spot exercises where they go i don't know if that's uh good for you type of thing right so i feel like as a coach you do more than just provide exercise you have to give them the tools to succeed in life when they have to do this on their own right like I'm very fortunate that a lot of my clients have stuck with me for years, years. I like to think that it's because of my, you know, amazing personality, but I think it's just because they see the value of what I provide day in, day out, month after month, year after year, right? I'm constantly trying to improve myself and I'm constantly trying to do that because now I can improve the life of another human being standing in front of me. Um... You know what? This was a good episode. I think I'm going to end it here because I could probably talk for another hour, but my time is trying to run up. This was a lot of fun. I think I'm going to end up trying to do this more often to have a little bit longer podcast episodes. I said podcast really weird there. Um, Maybe I'll do something like this once a month or we'll see what happens. But I want to thank you guys for sticking around, listening, watching, if you're watching at home. And if you guys have any feedback, questions, thoughts, concerns, let me know. I'm always here to help. Um, You guys are amazing. Honestly, I am so humbled to see so many different... And I, I forgot to look at my top cities. I'm sorry. I'm so humbled to see so many people around the world listen to me ramble. Um support me buy my fucking shirts and sweaters and shit like that and to have people like in Saudi Arabia or in India or in the UK listening to my show like so fucking cool you guys are the best so hit the show notes add me on Facebook add me on Instagram 
I'll say what's up and ask you what I can do to help. And give me a five-star review on this podcast, either on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, Stitcher Radio, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Thank you, thank you, thank you, guys. Until next time.